good. Good morning, everyone. I'm not going to go up on the podium. I prefer to be down here with you guys. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Mark and Shea for inviting me to speak here today. It's a, it's a great privilege. I think uh, the initiative that uh, the Canadian Space Commerce Association is taking upon itself to put together an association that's interested in commerce and, and focusing on commerce and space is, is, is an excellent an excellent one that deserves uh, all of our support because it's it's a challenge that we're all going to face and it's actually the background of the subject that we're talking about today is new ventures and, and new systems that go into outer space. So I want to thank him for that. It's great to be here. Particularly great to be here with you, Robin, because uh, my family's from Glasgow and grew up on the River Clyde, so we know that the best things are built in Scotland and get exported elsewhere. So I won't keep talking about that. You might kind of what I'm saying, okay? But we've got it covered, right? So good. So, Clyde Space, here we go. Uh, so, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, Mark um, put up a few questions that I, I do want to refer to because they were excellent. Um, I'll, I'll go to them quickly. With the fast developments of small set technologies, the price point of developing solutions is shifting. And I'd like to talk about solutions to what? But what are you providing solutions to with your constellation, with your satellites, with your system you're putting up in space. Keep your eye on the needs is where I'm going. Are we seeing a change in the role of private ventures and EO brought about by small sack technology? Do you want to fill the sky because you can? Or do you want to provide value to the planet? And would it mean for this role of private satellite sector in supporting previous government applications? Let's get one thing straight. Quote from Wade Larson, guy who knows how it gets it done. We stand on the shoulders of giants when we go into space. It's because our government invested money in radar sat that we can say there's a market for Earth observation imagery. It's because governments all around the world invested in technology that said, hey, let's try and do that. But we stand on their shoulders and then we build on what they developed in terms of technology. Need for research and development, fundamental need for people to get behind that research and development and put meaningful instruments that can give meaningful information to people on the planet. We're seeing a lot of investment coming into the sector, particularly in the funding of new EO constellations. Whilst the positive, are we risking an investment bubble? Bubble. A thin veneer that's quite transparent, filled with hot air. So where do you want to put your money? An ancient Roman, if you want to give it, well, I'm sorry, I don't have to go to the next slide. I need the, uh, the thing. You can read that. An ancient Roman would have a lot in common with somebody on this planet up to about 1840. That's about 2,000 years of not a lot happening. If you want to understand how time is, you want to call me say time is accelerating. How is time accelerating? For 2,000 years, an ancient Roman could have walked into any village community and said, yes, it looks about like it was when I left it 2,000 years ago. But it's not like that anymore. In 1879, the electric light bulb and the combustion engine were developed within three months of each other. In the 1880s, we developed motion pictures, a telephone, and phonograph. And that changed the world. And that's, what's, that's what we're all facing, a fast-changing world. So if you're on this planet, I'll go back to my first slide, for two seconds, as my Indian friend told me, you're dead a long time. You're on this planet for two seconds. What do you want to do with your time? So Greg Weiler put up his purpose, our massive transformational purpose is to empower humanity to preserve our planet. And that means we want meaningful information to make decisions. The Secretary of Forestry in the United States predicts that by the year 2025, two-thirds of his budget will be spent fighting forest fires. $1.8 billion a year to fight forest fires in the United States alone. Rivers and oceans. By 2025, let me get my statistics right, 1.8 billion people will be living in absolute water scarcity. Two thirds of the world will be living under water stressed conditions. That's something to think about. By 2050, 9.6 billion people will be living on this planet and the world's food production will have to increase from today by 70%. By 2050, by 2030, the world will need 50% more energy. 
And surprise to the environmentalists, it doesn't come from the pump. It has to get out of the ground and you have to get it safely to the pump. And you need to monitor it the whole length. And while pipelines are the safest way to transport oil and energy, only 1 in 20 spills are detected in pipelines. And 80% of spills are bigger than 150,000 liters. Michael Bloomberg, the president of the C40, the collection of 40 large cities around the world, has told us that by 2050, 70% of the world's population will be living in urban centers. That's two and a half billion more people living in cities that are going to need to be monitored. Some people think that the next world war, World War III, will be caused by an inorbit collision. Because somebody will wonder, how did that hit my satellite? And what caused it? And was it deliberate? These are real needs. These are real challenges. And as we've all learned from space, from the first images that ever came down from a satellite, and we saw that little blue planet, we're all in this together. We're all in it together. We're all on the same team. We're all looking for the same answers to the same problems. Food, water, living on the planet in a comfortable way. Lots of data doesn't help, because big data doesn't make decisions. So more data streams and more petabits of data isn't going to solve the problem. Leaders will make decisions, and in order for leaders to make decisions, they need information and intelligence that they can take action on. You wanted a hamburger, and you got GPS coordinates to figure out where to find the cow. You need more direct solutions to the problems that you're facing. It's a cute cow too, I kind of like that picture. So, North Star, don't want too much of a promotion on it because there's a lot of ideas that are getting kicked around here and I really like these conferences because it really should be a debate and a discussion about what we're doing and what the problems that we're facing. So I don't want to promote too much our project, but I want to say that our focus, if we're going to empower humanity to preserve our planet, is going to mean delivered into the hands of decision makers information that they can use to do that. How will we do it? We'll do it with a constellation of satellites using hyperspectral and infrared sensors. And we'll also look at space using optical and infrared sensors to monitor the debris around the Earth. We've put together what I think is a pretty world class team of people that can address that problem, starting with uh, my partner in the United States, Shell Stakistad, whose company has navigated satellites to pretty much every planet including the recent one that went to Pluto, took pictures. The guy who goes behind the green door to talk to the U.S. government is Bob Mascal. <coughs> who used to be the head of the Canadian Center for Remote Sensing. Andre Dupree, everybody knows, he's the former defender of the free world, and now he's working for his own company, SSCL. Charles Sirois, if you don't know him, uh, he's an interesting character. He was the king of uh, pagers and the pager business in the 1980s, and he saw that cell phones would be the future. And as he owned every paging company in Canada, he made a deal with Bell to create Bell Cellular Enterprises. And then he sold that and bought Teleglobe. And then he moved on and created, actually, and funded Orcom, the Orcom satellite system. His statement to me, and I think it's an important one for all of us, given the problems that I listed, not it's a doomsday, it's a challenge for all of us. You can't manage what you don't measure. You have to measure in order to be able to manage. And when you go to the doctor, you don't want them to take a Polaroid of you and say, yeah, I can see you're sick because I can look at this picture and see that you're sick. You either need an x-ray or an MRI. So you need sensors that are going to give you information that's going to tell you what you need to know. Is the crop infested? Is it over-irrigated? Is that collision going to happen? How are you going to do all those calculations? Those are the challenges that are facing everyone on this planet. And when you're addressing needs, it's not so hard to understand the business plan that's behind it when it's needs that affect everyone. We all got to eat, we all got to drink, we all got to live on this planet. So the business plan 101 is address those needs. Uh, Candace Johnson, founder of SES in Luxembourg, uh, Patrick Daniel, former CEO of uh, Enbridge, and knows all about solving problems with pipelines because he was the CEO of Enbridge when they had one million gallons spilled into the Kalamazoo River that cost $1.2 billion to clean up. $1.2 billion to clean up. 
billion dollars a year to fix forests, food, water, everything. It's not hard to figure that if you're following down that chain, when I walk my dog at night, I go down to the Ottawa River. And at one night I went out of the Ottawa River and I looked out at the, at the river and I saw, wow, here's these waves crashing up and making a lot of noise. And it's actually quite scary. I went back three days later, it was frozen. That's a force of nature. The needs of the planet are a force of nature. And anybody who goes into the satellite industry or talks about building a constellation or setting up a nanosat or doing anything needs to set his sail to pick up that force of nature like a wind and make use of it. Otherwise, I'll be monitoring you with our sensors in space as space debris. And we don't need congestion in space. We want to change the way we see the world. I'd like everyone to be inspired to do the same. There's a lot of interesting projects going on, talking about interplanetary visits with nanosats. It's very exciting stuff. How are you going to change the way you see the world? Because at the end of the day, we leave it to them. And it's our responsibility to do the best we can with what we do. Hollywood has an expression. We always go to where lightning just struck. Every great movie just follows another great movie and says, let's just try and repeat that. Let's not do that. Let's do something unique. We're trying to do something unique with North Star. I'd like to inspire anybody who wants to build a satellite constellation and put anything up in space to do the same.